And happy uh, Father's Day to everyone. <laughs> and uh, welcome to everyone, father or not, but uh, we love fathers, and the Lord has blessed us with many, many wonderful fathers in our congregation. We're grateful for each one. Um, you know, Julie's, I loved Julie's prayer today because it did recognize that uh, there are a wide variety of uh, types of fathers. I'm sure they're all represented here this morning. Just would urge you, if you have a, an earthly father, whatever the circumstances may have been, get a hold of them. Let them know you appreciate them, whatever the circumstances, and let God work through whatever they may have been that weren't great. I was fortunate to have a, a wonderful father. Um, now that he's gone, I miss him more than ever, kind of on a daily basis. Uh, my, my best thing is my daughter is here today. What a, that's the greatest, uh, probably, Father's Day present that I could have. And so, um, so the best thing we can have is the Heavenly Father, right? We've got a Father. We all have a Father. We have a wonderful Father. Well, turn with me to Luke chapter uh, 9, and as you're turning there, I want to thank Jesse for uh, filling in so well last week. Yes, I did listen to it. I always do. And uh, now that we have it in video, in case you don't know, the, the, we have video online now as well as the audio, but because of that, I could see how he's dressed and everything, and I noticed he had a tie on. I didn't even know you had a tie, brother. I, I'd say, it's the first time I've seen it. So I don't know, it was an early Father's Day present or something maybe, um, but it looked great. And thank you uh, so much for filling in so admirably on the subject of our reconciliation with God from 2 Corinthians. Well, we're in Luke chapter uh, 9 today as we journey through Luke slowly, line by line, verse by verse, but I hope you're getting to know Jesus Christ. He's a, he's a man's man, and he's also a God's God, and what a wonderful thing as we're studying his life here through the eyes of Luke. Now, I'm reading this morning, and if you'll follow along with me, beginning in verse 18 of Luke 9. Now, it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Father, we thank you for this word, the inerrant, perfect word of God that you've taken time to write down and provide to us through no easy task over the years as we understand how this Bible came to us. Thank you. Help us, Father, not only to appreciate it, but help us to hear what it is that you have to say and then help us to be doers of the word. We pray this, Father, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There was a... Uh, there was an, a government lecturer named Emily uh, Kim, Kimbrough a few years ago who was, who was going to be introduced at this conference. So the MC got up and she was about to introduce her, started really to do the introduction, and this loud hissing noise came from somewhere in the sound system. So she noticed that over at the side, behind the curtain, someone was beckoning for her, so she went over to see what was going on, and when she came back... She made this announcement. She said, well, before we continue with the program, I have some unhappy news. She said, we will, we're going to be delayed for just a little bit because we have discovered that there's a screw loose in our speaker. <laughs> now, some of you may feel that way every Sunday. I, I, I don't know. It's a possibility. But I do know this. I know that the disciples on this occasion thought the speaker had a screw loose. I hope I can help you understand what was going through their mind as Jesus said the words that he said to them here in this passage of Scripture. Luke has, throughout the passages we looked at so far, has, has recorded Jesus' claims to be Messiah. 
And he's shown us how those claims are backed up by fulfilled prophecy over and over again in the life of Christ. He's shown us how those claims are backed up and confirmed by the spectacular miracles, spectacular both in terms of content as well as quantity that Jesus did in his earthly life. And the disciples are beginning to get it. As reflected there in verse 20, when Peter answered, you know, and said, when Jesus said, who am I? Jesus, Peter says, the Christ of God. They were beginning to understand. But the implications of this are not at all clear yet. They get that he's Christ, the Messiah. Christ means Messiah, anointed one. And they get that he's even more than that because Matthew's account of this gospel tells us that Peter also said, you're the son of the living God. So they're getting it. But while they're getting who he is, they don't yet understand what that means. Although they think they do. They think they do. They have the right words. They got the right phrase, right? Messiah, the son of the living God. But they have at this point the wrong definition because their definition is the Messiah must mean immediate deliverer. The reason they had that wrong definition is that they were steeped in the Jewish tradition in which they had grown up, which basically ignored the Old Testament passages that talked about a suffering Messiah. And so they concentrated all their hopes around the Old Testament prophecies about a Messiah who would be a deliverer. They had half the story, but they didn't have the whole story. So when Jesus looks at Peter, which he did according to Matthew's gospel, and Matthew um, and Matthew's account of this, and said to Peter, after he said these words, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying, bingo, Peter, you got it right. That's exactly who I am. And at that point, the, the, the apostles would have been riding high. We have the Messiah who was prophesied all the way through the Old Testament, and bam, here he is standing right here in front of us. But here's the problem. Along with that expectation, or with that recognition, would have been their expectation of what he was going to do next, which is their question would have been, okay, now that we know you're the Messiah, when is it all going to happen? When are we going to take over? Their expectation was that with this confession of who Jesus is, the next thing Jesus would have been saying is, hey, guys, come here, here's the plan. Let me give you the plan. We're headed for Jerusalem. Here's the plan. Here's how we're going to take over. That's what they would have expected. Here's what they got, verse 21. What they got was he strictly charged them and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. They're thinking our speaker's got to screw loose. This isn't the way Messiahs talk. Something is desperately wrong here. I mean, they couldn't have been more surprised if he said, okay, now that you know I'm the Messiah, let's just go out and commit mass suicide. They, this, this, this just didn't, cal this, this just didn't calculate, it didn't compute to these men. Now in Matthew's gospel again, chapter 16, the parallel account, we see that it so much didn't compute with them that Peter actually pulled Jesus aside. When you hear Jesus say, well, we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be killed there. And Peter says in, in Matthew 16, 22, he said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I, you know, th this is a side note, but don't miss the fact here that Jesus one second turns to Peter and said, Peter, this is wonderful. What you just said about me being Messiah, you didn't come up with that on your own. The Lord God in heaven gave you that information. And the next minute he's talking to him and saying, get thee behind me, Satan. That's how quickly we can change from being directed by the Lord God in heaven to being directed by someone else. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, be continually, continuously, every moment of the day, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how quickly things can turn around. That's a side note. That's for free. But you see that in that, in that passage, all right? 
So, so, so Jesus is basically saying to Peter, listen, you're, you're nothing but Satan in fisherman's clothing here, Peter. You need to disappear for a moment because you're a hindrance to the plan of God. Now, we can be pretty tough on Peter here and say he should have known, he should have you know, been following Christ. If he's going to recognize him as Christ, why would he pull him aside in the next minute and say, hey, listen, what you're saying is crazy. But let's admit this was a shock, right? This is a shock. This announcement that he's going to Jerusalem to die. It's been hinted at. Even in Luke's gospel, we've seen it hinted at. Simeon told Mary, Jesus' mother, when Jesus was still a baby and they presented him at the temple. Remember how Simeon said, a sword will pierce through your own soul also? This was a hint at the death of Christ that was going to come later on, but it was a veiled comment, and, and undoubtedly the, the apostles at this time didn't even know that something like that had been spoken. These guys had heard Jesus tell them in Luke 5, 35, that the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in those days. They'd heard that, but that didn't compute much either. They certainly wouldn't have read the cross into that statement. But Mark tells us in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, verse 32, that at this point in time, right now, as, as, as we're in this account, this is when Jesus said this plainly. So if there was any confusion before, now Jesus begins to make this very clear. I'm going to die. That's where we're headed. I'm going to die. There's no more ambiguity. From, from here on, Jesus hammers this point home the disciples. And as we've seen before, they still don't get it, but it's not for lack of him trying. We're told in Matthew 16, verse 21, that from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised, Jesus warned him, but it just didn't compute. Now, you know, just put yourself in their shoes for just a moment, though. I mean, you've given your whole life, you've given up your, your means of livelihood, the apostles had, They'd given up fishing and, and, and the way they made a living or, or their tax collecting, whatever it was, and they had come, they've given up everything to come and follow him, and now he's telling them, I'm going to go die. How would you feel? You'd probably be like them. You're thinking, I, I, I wonder what he really means by that. <laughs> Surely he can't mean I'm going to go die. There must be some deeper meaning. But there's even more strangeness in this passage. Look at verse 20, 21. Peter's confessed him as the Christ of God, which to Jesus' is satisfaction. And yet in verse 21, it says, and he strictly charged and commanded them. Now, it's the word strictly. And then twice he emphasizes it. He commanded them and he charged them what? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. What is that about? I mean, if, if you're Messiah and you're coming, why wouldn't you want people to know? You'd think he would want everybody to know. And yet Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody. If you've been paying attention as we've been going through Luke, you'll remember that several times Jesus does this, right? Quite often. When he raised Jairus' daughter, the, uh, the leader of the synagogue, when he raised her from the dead, remember in Luke 8, 56, it says he charged them to tell no one what had happened. When he healed the leper, in Luke 5, verse 14, he charged him to tell no one. After healing a deaf man in Mark chapter 8, or Mark chapter 7, I think it is, verse 36, I think it says Jesus charged them to tell no one. So what is this don't tell policy? <laughs> don't tell seems to be going on all the time, and you would think Jesus would want these things told. Well, the key to it is found in Matthew 17, verse 9. I won't look at it, but just let me read it for you. Matthew 17, verse 9, at the time of the transfiguration, which is the next thing we're going to be studying, at the time of the transfiguration, when they're coming back, Peter, James, and John, Jesus tells them this, tell no one the vision... So there's the common thing, but this time he says, tell no one the vision until, until the Son of Man 
is raised from the dead. After that, tell everybody. Why? Because here's why, beloved. Because the message that Jesus was trying to communicate here wasn't about healing. And it wasn't about feeding 5,000 people. It wasn't even about the fact that he was the Messiah and even that he was God in the flesh. Yes, that was part of it. And that was an important part of it. But the message was the cross and the resurrection. That's where salvation is. And so Jesus says, I don't want you to tell until you have the real message, until you've got the full, the full fleshed out message of the cross and the resurrection. So in Luke 9, what he's saying here is, you know, don't tell them that I'm Messiah because I have to go die and be raised first. That's the story. That's the gospel. After that, tell everybody. But until then, I'm not really interested that people get all excited about healings or that they get all excited about deliverance from Rome. I have a much greater mission up here. I have a deliverance from sin to offer. It's far more important than deliverance from Rome. I have a, an eternal blessing of healing to offer, far greater than any physical healing. Let's don't get, let's don't get our perspectives confused. The message of the gospel extends beyond this life. That's why I came. I came, I came to address the greatest problem that mankind has, which is not physical impairment or dominion by Rome. I came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's all of us. That's what I came to do. And that can only be accomplished through the death and resurrection that I'm headed for in Jerusalem. That's the gospel. That's the good news. So when it's fleshed out and when it's done, now you can tell everybody. Now one other thing to notice here before we actually get into the sermon. Um, nobody's going to bite on that? i thought, sure I'd get some help. Well, you notice the outline hasn't gone very far yet, but we'll get there. Look at the word must in verse 22. The word must in verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer. It's, the, it's a Greek phrase, just a little word dei, D-E-I, but it means absolute necessity. It's absolutely necessary that this happen. Jesus is saying he must go to Jerusalem to suffer. He's not saying, I'm going to Jerusalem and maybe something's going to happen there. I'm going to Jerusalem and it may be out of my control and some, you know, be prepared guys because I don't know exactly what's coming. Probably, maybe I'm going to have to suffer there. It's not the issue. It says I'm going to Jerusalem because it's necessary to suffer. It's a written in stone necessity. Why? Why? Let me give you three reasons really quickly. First of all, it's a necessity because it's been prophesied that that's what's going to happen. The Old Testament had told us that Jesus was going, the Messiah was going to come, and Messiah was going to die, and it not only said he was going to die, it told how he was going to die. In Psalm 22, it tells us that they, in the words of David, they have pierced my hands and my feet. That was written hundreds of years before, before execution by crucifixion was ever practiced in this world. Isaiah 53 he says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Hundreds of years before crucifixion was used, Jesus is prophesied to be one who's going to die by crucifixion. It has to happen because God said it, and so it has to happen. Secondly, it has to happen because it's the plan of God before the foundation of the world. Did you know that? You know, the, the, the death of Jesus wasn't just an accident. It wasn't just, you know, a politically unfortunate thing, a miscalculation of history. It was no plan B. It was planned before the foundation of the world. Peter says it this way later on. 1 Peter 1.20 he says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Yes, it's a must. But here's the third reason, and the greatest reason of all, of course, and that is the death of Jesus Christ must happen to pay the penalty for sin. Pay the penalty for sin. No death, no forgiveness. 
no resurrection, no hope beyond the grave. Peter again says, knowing that you were ransomed from your feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. How are we ransomed, beloved? How are we saved from our sins? How do we have eternal life? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. No death, no deliverance. Peter didn't get it at the time, but he got it loud and clear later on. So true salvation, what we're seeing through this whole passage, which we introduced a couple weeks ago, is that true salvation is a costly venture. True salvation costs God the Father. As we've seen, he has to actually give his son and willingly watch him go through the suffering that he went through in this life and then the pain of death. It costs the son, and it will cost us. And so as we're looking at this passage, we're looking at the cost to each one of these in terms of three questions. Who is Jesus, which we looked at a couple weeks ago, and we found out that Jesus is the God-man. He's God come to earth, clothed in human flesh. He's the second person of the Godhead, and God the Father has sent God the Son specifically to die for sin, and he has to watch him go through that. That's the price that he pays. Now today we want to look at, begin to look at the question, what did Jesus do? Who is Jesus? What did Jesus do? What must I do will be the third question in this whole section between verses 18 and 27. What did Jesus do? You know, Jesus is the king of all kings, right? The Bible identifies him that way. But before he gets to the crown, he has to go by way of the cross. And the reason for that is, you know, it's just one little three-letter word, which is sin. We, we all, you know, our human, our human tendency, not our human tendency, it's our human absolute habit. It's the, it's the culture we grew up in. We totally, we totally write off sin as no big deal, right? We minimize it. We minimize it in the way we talk about it. We minimize it in our minds. Lies become spin. Adultery becomes an affair. Sounds so cosmopolitan, doesn't it? Bitterness becomes defending my rights. Revenge becomes evening the score. Anger becomes righteous indignation. I had a right to be angry. We, we sing about it in Broadway songs, you know, like, I can't say no from Oklahoma. And I love Oklahoma, but I don't care much for that song. Or how about the song from... From Camelot, the lusty month of May, which pays tribute to going blissfully astray, blissfully sinning. That's where we've come in our culture. And those are, you know, Broadway shows from 50 years ago. I hate to tell you what goes on now. We minimize sin. But, but, but I must tell you, beloved, in the mind of God, sin is not minimal. It's a violation of his very character. And let me go further. It's not just God who is harmed by sin in the sense that it violates his character. It's us most of all. Sin does unseen damage to our souls. There's not a problem that you can name emotionally, physically, that's not tied to sin. We don't want to recognize that. We don't want to acknowledge that. Almost every counseling problem that comes my way is a result of some kind of sin. We minimize sin to our own detriment. If we're going to have hope, it must be through the person of Jesus Christ, and there's only hope because he goes to Jerusalem to suffer. The price had to be paid. The moment, you know, the moment that Adam and Eve in that Garden of Eden decided to take of that fruit, any possibility of us ever being redeemed without pain was extinct. Any possibility of man ever being able to be with God forever went away unless there was the cost, the payment made for sin. So Jesus is going to Jerusalem to pay the price for us to be truly saved. That's why he's going to Jerusalem. Now Luke uses four infinitives here to describe the price. 
in verse 22. He says he must suffer, right? He's got to suffer. He's got to be rejected. He's got to be killed. And then he's got to be resurrected. Four things have to happen, are going to happen in Jerusalem. Now, I want to look at just the first one today, that he's, he has to suffer, and then we'll look at the rest of them next week. But what, it, what does it mean that Jesus has to suffer. And notice, the phraseology is fascinating here because notice he says, the son of man must suffer many things. He doesn't say, I must suffer. He says, the son of man must suffer. Now we know, if you, if you, if you read the gospels at all, you're, you're aware of the fact that the term son of man is Jesus' favorite designation for himself. He often refers to himself as the son of man. But why does he, why does he do that? He does that because it's a reference. You know, we kind of look at it and say, well, he's just referring to his human nature. And obviously, if he's the son of man, it does refer to that. But that's not the point of using that phrase. That phrase comes from Daniel chapter 7. And for the sake of time, we won't look at it. But Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, where God gave Daniel, 600 years before Christ, a preview of where world history is going. And at the end of world history, he describes a time when there will be one coming in the clouds of glory who is called the Son of Man. And here's what he says about him. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall never pass away. And his kingdom shall be one that is not destroyed, as opposed to all the earthly kingdoms that have come before. So it's describing somebody there that's an amazing, he's he's got to be a man because he's the son of man, and yet he's got to be more than that because he's eternal, he's forever, his kingdom is forever. And so Jesus picks that term, that person who has that kind of power and that kind of authority, and he says, this one who is the son of man, that comes from Daniel 7, the son of man who has all this power and authority and so on, is going to suffer. Why? To pay the penalty for the sin of the people that will become part of his kingdom. Jesus was purposely noting that he is the one who will have everlasting dominion. He is the one who will have an eternal kingdom. He is the one who all the earth will save, will will serve, and yet he is the one who will suffer in order to bring all of this about. It's incomprehensible. This is the message of the gospel. This is the message of the gospel. The one who will be completely in charge of everything is the one who pays the price for everything. Now notice when it says that he will suffer, it says that he will suffer many things. When we hear about Jesus suffering, I think our mind immediately goes to the cross, rightfully so. Jesus certainly suffered ultimately at the cross, and we're going to look at that. But next week. But but notice it says here that he suffered many things. And I I want to point out that Jesus' suffering didn't, it wasn't just at the cross. (laughs) Suffering of Jesus was suffering in many ways. And I'm just going to mention two of them today in addition to the cross that I think are important. And the first one is that Jesus suffered because of his holy character. So he suffered all of his life. He suffered because of his holy character. He says this in John 15, Verse 20 says, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, this is before he dies, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Jesus was persecuted all his life. Why? Because he was because he was good. Because he lived a holy life. That's all you have to do to be persecuted. Perhaps you've found that out, discovered that. Doesn't take much. Try being the only kid in school who doesn't pick on the oddball, right? The guy that's different from everybody else. In fact, in fact, if you really want to get persecuted, befriend that person. 
And pretty soon you'll be in the same boat as he is watching everybody else make fun, mock, persecute. Try being the one at work who does such a good job that the slackers look bad. Persecution for being good, right? Try being the wife who, you know, discourages her husband from understating the taxable income. And you may find that for being good, you suffer a little persecution. Or be the one who tells the boss, no, we shouldn't cheat on this proposal, we shouldn't tell this lie. You'll find out that it doesn't take much to be persecuted for being good. Be the one who leaves the group because the stories are getting a little dicey. Suffer persecution. It doesn't take much to be persecuted. All you have to do is be good and you will suffer. You'll find out what it's like. But Jesus wasn't just good. Jesus was what? Perfect. So if we might suffer a little because of our character, Jesus suffered greatly. His own family, according to Mark 3.21, thought he was, quote, out of his mind. Think about his brother, James. Did you ever think about what a tough job James had following a perfect older brother? Some of you maybe have been in that boat a little bit, right? Everywhere James goes, Jesus has been there first. And they're all saying, James, why can't you be like Jesus? He's perfect. It's no wonder, I think, that we get the statement in John chapter 7. Maybe you want to look at this one. It's an interesting one. John chapter 7. See how Jesus' brothers are ready to send him down to Judea at the time when they know he's number one on the most wanted list in Judea. Look at John 7, verse 3. They say to him, leave here and go to Judea. John 7, verse 3. Go to, go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now, beloved, this was not a message of encouragement. They were not trying to say, we know you got an important message and we want you to get it across. That's not what's going on here. They're priming him for the hangman's news. Why? Look at verse 5 of John 7. For not even his brothers believed in him. You think it didn't hurt to have your own brothers to put you in mortal danger? You think you come from a dysfunctional family? So did Jesus. suffered because of his great goodness. Jesus' heart, I'm sure, was torn in two by their hatred. I'm happy to say, to the best of our knowledge, those brothers became believers when they saw their older brother raised from the dead later on. James became the greatest um, leader in the, in, the, in the church in Jerusalem. His famous, famously, famous nickname was Old Camel Knees because he spent so much time praying to his older brother. Jesus suffered secondly because of his compassion. Turn, if you're in John 7, just turn over to John 11. I, you know, frankly, I, knowing what he knew, I don't know how Jesus went through life. I mean, when, when, when you stop to really think about the pain that's all around you, the pain that's, that people suffer on a daily basis, some of the awful things that happen in life, how can you help but suffer? John 11 is really an interesting passage. In John 11, Jesus gets news that his friend Lazarus, probably is one of his very best friends here on earth, that his friend Lazarus was sick unto death. He delayed two days. When he finally went, it was two more days before he got there. So four days later, he finally arrives on the scene. Lazarus is already dead. Martha, Lazarus' sister, comes running out to meet Jesus in verse 21 of of John 11, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd just been here, my brother would not have died. You, you notice constantly in Scripture, people have this tendency to think Jesus could heal anything, but they don't think he could raise anything from the dead. And it's seen here. Martha says that, and Jesus immediately reminds her, I'm the resurrection and the life, verse 25. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he will live. Wonderful reassurance to her. 
But now notice verse 33. They, they, in the meantime, they, they, they send word to Mary, the other sister, and Mary comes. She meets him outside. Verse 32, and when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. Two sisters, same comment from each one. Obviously, they'd been talking about this, right? But notice the difference. In verse 33, notice what Jesus, Jesus told Martha, hey, look, babe, don't worry about it. I'm the resurrection and the life. Things are under control, no problem. But what does he do with Mary? When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews had also come with her weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit. And he was greatly troubled. And look at verse 35. Jesus wept. There's so much in this passage. In this passage, you see both the, the deity and the humanity of Christ. I'm sure this is why John put these side by side. When he speaks to Martha, it's out of his deity, right? I am the resurrection and the life. If you want to look at it from a counseling perspective, Martha needed a ministry of truth. So Jesus reminds her, this is who I am. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's God in the flesh. But when he speaks to Mary, who needs a ministry of tears, she just needs somebody to sympathize and empathize with her. His humanity is seen. Do you see that? Do you see how the, how the two characters and natures of Jesus are here and he knows how to address the counseling situation that's need for each one and they're totally different even though their mindset is the same? What a wonderful passage. Humanity of Christ. He had compassion. He suffered because of his compassion. Ma Ma Matthew 9 verse 36 tells us when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When he entered Jerusalem for the last time, recorded in Math Matthew 23, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered you, your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. You were not willing. Broke his heart. Jesus suffered because of his compassion. Now here's the question I want to leave you with, and I want you to turn to Hebrews 5 to answer it. <coughs> Why all the suffering? Why all this suffering? Suffering. Yes, the death of Christ hurt and he suffered in his death, but why 33 years of suffering? Why not? Why not? Why didn't the Father just send Jesus down to earth for a day, have him killed the next day, and it's over on a long weekend? Why? Why all the suffering? Hebrews tells us, and it's an amazing answer. Hebrews 5, verse 8. Although he was a son, and here it means son of God, if you go back up through that chapter, although he was a son of God, speaking of Jesus, he learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, I mean, is that a, are you shocked? What does that mean? Jesus learned obedience. So, 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 so was there some point in time at which he was disobedient? And so like a child who acts up, you've got to discipline them and make them suffer so that they learn to obey. Is that what's going on here? And of course, that's not at all what's going on here. The point of this passage is Jesus learned how to obey hard things by obeying easy things first. As a man, he learned obedience. And remember, he's living his earthly life only by virtue of his human nature, by, not by virtue of his divine nature. That's why he was tempted in all points like as we are. So he's learning obedience through suffering by gradually step-by-step -step process. How do you learn calculus? You walk into your first grade class and they say, they say hey, we're going to learn differential equations today, right? 
not in my class, I hope not in yours, right? You learn calculus by the time you're a senior in high school or college or whatever, by step by step, right? You gotta, you gotta be brought along. That's how Jesus learned obedience. You th if you think it was easy to obey the Father in the human nature of Christ and go to the cross, I challenge you, go look at Gethsemane one more time. The place where Jesus sweat drops of blood so intense was his desire not to lose this fellowship with the Father that he had had all of this time and forever, and he knew that's what was going to happen on the cross. And the Father saying, no, you have to go. And Jesus saying, oh, but if there's just any way, how come he could obey? I'll tell you why. 30 years of obedience in smaller things led him to obey the really, really big thing. Beloved, he wouldn't have been able to do that in his human nature if he hadn't learned obedience through suffering. Do you see that? This is what Jesus did for us. This is what he was willing to go through for us. Learned obedience through suffering. You know, when I, you learn to trust through small things, right? I used to, used to you know, do a dumb thing. I used to rappel off cliffs. I can't even look over the, you know, the, 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 the second story balcony anymore and not get dizzy. But I used to do that. But the way, you know how you learn how to rappel off cliffs? First you, first you, you do a two-foot cliff. And you, and you learn to trust the rope and you learn to trust your partners who are holding on to the safety rope, right? And then you go over a five-foot cliff and then you go over a 10-foot and you do all of that before you go over a 100-foot cliff. Why? Because you're learning to trust through the suffering. And I, and I mean, it is suffering when you back off that cliff for the first time. That's what Jesus was doing here in his earthly life. Everything the Father asked him to do, he did. And as it got, got increasingly tougher and tougher and tougher until finally the Father could say, I want you to go to the cross. And Jesus would say, yes. I will go, no, he was never disobedient, but he was increasingly obedient to increasingly harder things. That's what got him to cross-level obedience. But notice the second thing in verse 9, he was made perfect through suffering. So the same question again, right? Well, so what does that mean? Was he imperfect at some point in time? Of course, the answer there is, is no. He was not imperfect, but what he was was he was not tested yet. Just like in the Garden of Eden, were Adam and Eve perfect? Oh no. They were innocent, had never sinned. But they weren't perfect because they hadn't been tested. You remember what happened when they did get tested and it wasn't even a very difficult test, right? Failed the test. Jesus was made perfect through suffering because he increasingly obeyed and he suffered and he became perfect. The word perfect in Greek is the word teleos. Many of you study this. It means perfect or complete. It's, it's both concepts wrapped in, up into one. For example, I, I built a, a grandfather clock one time, right? And, and so halfway through, everything's sitting over here. Is there anything wrong with that clock as it sits there halfway through? No, there's nothing wrong with it. It hasn't sinned, it's not disobedient or anything else, but neither is it perfect. Because why? Because it's not complete. You wouldn't take that and put it in your living room. You have to complete it. That's what Jesus was learning through suffering. Here's another way to help you understand what it means to, 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 to become perfect perfect through suffering. I, my brother John loved model cars when, he was, when we were growing up. You know, those kind you put together and you glue them together and then you get all the paint out and you, and you do all this stuff. And, and, and hopefully you don't sniff the glue along the way, right? But he loved these model cars. For me, you know, give me a ball. I don't bat, a bat, bat and ball, a basket and a ball, whatever. Just give me a ball and I'm, I'm good to go. I really didn't care about those cars. So suppose we both go into the toy store, right? And we see all these super cool model cars there. There they are right on the shelf. And we look around and there's absolutely nobody in sight. Easy pickings. We can have these cars, no problem. Now for me, 
That's no temptation. I don't suffer. I walk away because I don't even care. But poor old John, he's got a decision to make, right? I really want that car. But I know that the Lord really wouldn't want me to steal that car. He's got to make a decision. And so he makes the decision finally to walk away. I think I want Jesus more than I want that car. But what's he doing? He's learning obedience through suffering. You avoid temptation and you're going to suffer. Expect it. Rejoice in it. It's making you perfect. And that's what it did with Christ. It's the thing that rendered him perfect. Beloved, that's what the first 33 years of his life were about, becoming perfect through suffering. He felt the pain of turning away. We all think that Jesus just kind of walked through this life, no problem. Wasn't that way. The Bible tells us he was tempted in all points like as we are. That means he felt it. That means he wanted to have a lazy day where he stayed in bed. That means he wanted to be sexually immoral. It means that he wanted to do all these things. They were, they, were, they were a temptation to him just like they are to you. He wanted to have money. But he obeyed. And he became perfect through that obedience. And that's what made him the flawless lamb of God who could take away the sin of the world. Without temptation, there is no suffering Without suffering, there is no perfection. Without perfection, there's no redemption. So 33 years of preparation, he's going to Jerusalem to suffer, not to be made perfect, but because he is perfect. Made perfect through suffering. So did Jesus have a screw loose? The disciples thought so, I guarantee you. They didn't get this. If we'd been there, we would have thought so too. But I hope we can see now from the position of hindsight that we have. He didn't have a screw loose. He knew that the way to the crown was by way of the cross. He knew the truth of Philippians 2, verses 8 to 11, where Paul says, In being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, in earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what the suffering was about. So now I ask, have you bowed the knee to this Lord who did this for you? The story is told in 1863. A young woman from Wales left with her baby on her hip to walk down about a mile to where a neighbor lived to visit. But a huge blizzard blew in unexpectedly as she was on her way. And it soon became apparent that she was missing. She didn't show up where she was supposed to be. She didn't come back home. Search party was sent out. Search party looked around and eventually they found her somewhere off the path in an open field dressed only in her undergarments, frozen to death, but no baby. So they fr frantically began to search for the baby. And eventually, under a rock nearby, hidden away as best she could, and wrapped, away, wrapped, wrapped all in the mother's clothing, they found the baby, still alive and still well. She gave her life for her baby boy, who grew up to become David Lloyd Jones, the Prime Minister of England during the First World War. But beloved, you have a father who sent his only son to die for you, not just so you could live and become the Prime Minister of England, but so that you could become something much greater than that, so that you could become a child of God. I hope you know him. If he's not your father today, this would be the day. To me. See, see I, thought he, I thought he was my father when I was born. Oh, no. What does John say in John 1.11? He came to his own, his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them 
he gave the power to become the children of God. God is the Father only to those who have invited him in. I hope you've invited him in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We can call you Father. Thank you for going to Jerusalem to suffer. Thank you for all the suffering that prepared you to be the perfect sacrifice for sin. And so I pray that we know you as Father today. Lord, those of us who do, I'm sure, join me in just rejoicing in this relationship that we have that we did nothing to achieve, but that you've given us freely by your grace. If there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, I pray that they would open their heart just now. They would confess themselves to be a sinner. They would acknowledge they cannot make it on their own. They need the perfection of your son to be theirs. And you've promised that to them. Jesse preached that so eloquently last week. Our sin for your righteousness. What a trade that is. Thank you. 